God will use this journey to help others. Maybe you've heard those words during a tough time in your life, and it wasn't until later you smiled and thought, now I get it, God. That happened to Kathy Scheffler, my guest on A Widow's Heart. Kathy shares her story and how God led her to become the director of a nonprofit for widows. Hey, welcome to another episode of A Widow's Heart, and I'm excited to introduce to you our guest today, who is my friend and the current director of Widow Might. You hear me talking about Widow Might, a great nonprofit, a lot here on the podcast because they do such wonderful things for widows, especially early in their journey. Kathy Scheffler is director of Widow Might. Welcome, Kathy. Thanks, Pam. I'm so glad we could make this. Boy, we were trying for, I think, two months to get a date that we could both do this. Yes, I'm so glad it worked out finally. Yeah, absolutely. You have such a great smile on your face today, but I know that you, like many, have been on, you know, quite a journey that brought you to this point. Can you just tell us a little about yourself? Maybe introduce who you are, what you do. Like Pam said, my name is Kathy Scheffler, and I became a widow in 2012, so I guess it's been 12 years, unbelievably. Been about myself. I grew up on a farm, met my husband. He was also another farm boy. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So we didn't grow up together. We met when we were college age. Mm -hmm. The rest is history. After college, I moved to the big city. I moved to the Twin Cities and worked for an insurance company for 30 years. And then uh, just recently, I have moved into the nonprofit sector. So I am working for my church in their IT department. Oh, I love it. You're working in your church. And then you're also have such a huge role with Widow Might as director. Now, for those who don't know what Widow Might is, can you give us a little bit of a background on that? Absolutely. You are one of the founding board members, Pam. <laughs> yeah. So Widow Might began about the time that I became a widow. So it was being formed in 2011 and 2012. The mission is to help widows live, heal, grow, and thrive. And that is what we do. We don't ask for anything in return. We are 100% volunteer-led. So my role as an executive director is a volunteer one. I love what I get to do. I love interacting with the widows every day and just seeing what a difference it makes when they connect with other widows. Because, I mean, I think that's what Widow Might has found through the years as they were trying different things. That that was really the niche that we had that was not being met anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so just connecting widows with other widows, we started out by doing that at larger events. And then we'd see widows connect with somebody, so, you know, so good. Yeah. And then they'd be like, well, I don't want to wait till the next event in, you know, six to nine months. And that's when we've formed a lot of our widow connect groups. And so those meet on a monthly basis to allow widows to connect mm -hmm. in a more local setting, more coffee shops and homes and things like that. Now, one of uh, the signature events is, of course, the Novembering Luncheon, and that has evolved over the years from a dinner. And I remember when we when we first came up with that idea, because I loved Grief Share's last meeting where you brought a picture of your loved one and you shared it and you lit a candle. And, and I really wasn't thinking, I think it was early in my journey too. I'm like, I don't think new widows really want to come out at night and go to a dinner in the winter time. And it's evolved into a luncheon with an incredible speaker each time. And you do such a nice job with this event. It really is wonderful. When you put the map up on the screen of all of the Widow Connect groups that you were just talking about, it blows my mind every time I see that. So it started locally, but talk about how many there are and then how it's almost globally. I think we're up to 12. I keep losing count. In the time that I've been executive director, I became executive director in 2020, we have added at least three, maybe four new groups since then. Mm -hmm. Actually four. It is four. The farthest one right now is in Mesa, Arizona. And Kathy, wow. the leader there, has Minnesota Connections. She spends her summers up here. And so she last summer came up and went to like every group, but just visited them all. And we've been able to now that she's kind of established there. And we're getting better with the technology. We're even able to record some of our events like Novembering so that they can have their own mini Novembering down in Arizona. They can play the video. They can have a potluck. So we definitely are, are finding ways to make it, like you said, a little more globally. But yeah. that's that group. And then we also have one in northwestern Iowa. Those are the ones that are not within driving distance to come mm -hmm. to our events. And then because of uh, the good old pandemic a few <laughs> years ago, I know that in the West Metro group that I pop in 
from time to time that there are people checking in from different parts of even the world sometimes yes. when they find when they find us. They yeah. are holding their meetings over Zoom. And I think West Metro is one of the few that's still doing that. And I'd love to see one group get started that's all Zoom, like yeah. all on Zoom. I just haven't found the right leader for that yet. Right. You know, because I think there is such a need. I I would say at least a couple times a month, I get emails from ladies that are like, I want to have this wherever I live. What would it take? And we talk through that. We have meetings with them and explain what it looks like. And, you know, if they're ready to, then we'll yeah. form a group. We'll be praying for that. Yeah. I think that's a, just an, a logical next step. If you're wondering again what we're talking about. <laughs> I'm your host, Pam Lundell, Kathy Scheffler, Director of Widow Might, M-I-G-H-T. And you can uh, find out more at Widow Might, M-I-G-H-T. I always spell it, <laughs> dot org. And we'll come back to that. But you have a widow's heart. I know that. And can you tell us how you got there? Maybe a little bit about our journey. Sure. Well, I guess it starts with having a husband, right? So my husband. (laughs) Those guys. Yeah. My husband's name was Russ. 2009, he was diagnosed with, it's technically not considered a cancer, but it grows like a cancer. It just doesn't metastasize. And it was of the appendix, which I have doctors tell me that they've never even heard of it. There's one case per million people, basically. Never heard of it. Yeah. Exactly. And what it is, is it's a form he had. Basically, it was like a mucus-like substance that came off of his appendix and just started attaching to everything in his abdominal cavity. So by the time they found it, he could have had it for 20 years, they thought. So when we first got the diagnosis, we thought, okay, this was something we can manage. We were told it was like, eh, it's like a diabetes or something. You can, you know, we'll have to go in and do a surgery every 15, 20 years. A chronic condition that can be managed, yeah. But... My husband's one in a million. His case was he just had a lot of problems healing. Parts of it, if you know anything about cancer, it's like if you don't get it all, it keeps growing. Mm. And it also, it's very hard, like if you have a stitch or something, that it heals. So he just had a whole bunch of complications. 2009, he had the surgery late in that year and had a lot of complications for the end of the year. 2010 was somewhat of a normal year. I mean, we got to do the normal things. He kind of went back to work. He was working. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then towards the end of that year, they were kind of trying to do a follow-up surgery because they had done some surgery that they needed to reverse some things in the all the organs in there, you know. They found that it was growing much faster than they expected. Mm. So at that point, we did try some chemo in early 2011, that would have been. So he went through about six months of chemo, really wasn't having much effect. And so basically, he just kept getting weaker and weaker, and he just couldn't eat and things like that. So he did pass away then in January of 2012. And was he in hospice at that time? Very shortly. His last hospital visit was around Thanksgiving of the year before. And when he was there, they kind of started talking about palliative care, which is hospice care. As we talked through it, he was probably more in line with like, okay, let's find a, a place for me to go, you know, a facility or something. And I was just like, no, I want you home. This was even before a lot of us worked from home, but I did have that capability. And my and so I'm very thankful for my employer and their flexibility because even when he was in the hospital, I would work evenings and odd hours so I could spend as much time as I could in the hospital with him as the doctors came through and stuff. So when he was hospitalized in late November and he came home, he was basically bedridden at that point. And so we, you know, we got the in-home hospice, but that's a little bit tricky because hospice is meant to be comfort care and not any life sustaining things. And he was getting a lot of IV nutrition and that is considered not in the hospice realm. So that took a while because he wasn't quite ready to give that up yet. So it took about a month before he went into hospice care and we went into the condition that we were going to wean him off of the nutrition. How hard? I'm just sitting here because I know that you're able to tell the story now. The more you tell it, right, the easier right. it is to tell. But I'm just thinking of you, and this is your husband, and trying to make those decisions And as you're coherent. But it's like, am I really stopping nutrition for my husband? I can't imagine his thought process right. here I, I did, in that I, situation. He drove most of it. And I mean... I think we both saw that maybe the end was near, but it was just, you just do what you have to do in the moment, right? Right. But yeah, I let him drive most of the decisions up until the very, very end. And I will say that, you know, in the four weeks that he was in hospice care, he was very coherent. We had conversations. Obviously, he couldn't do anything for himself, but it was fine. But you hear about these people that have these deathbed vigils, like while they're waiting for the husband to pass away. Another blessing for me was that it was not that case. I literally nine o'clock the night before he passed away, we were having a conversation and that's when things kind of switched and he was gone by 7.30 the next morning. Mm. 
I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank I don't you. think I've ever said that to you because <laughs> I always just go, we're widows and we're just going to power forward and stuff like that. But there is that tender story about about a, a loved one, a husband, and we light those candles at the Novembering luncheon, and it's just a powerful reminder that we had almost 200 votive candles mm-hmm. lit at the last one, and each one stands for a loved one, a husband, you know, in heaven yeah. right now, and it it's just kind of takes my breath away. We're talking with Kathy Scheffler, director of Widow Might, and she knows she's walked the walk. It's interesting talking to different widows, and now widowers. I had our first <laughs> man that lost his wife on our last episode, Fred Colby. The seconds, all of a sudden, you realize your life has changed after they take their last breath, and you are now a widow. How did you make that transition, or did it take you a while? I think, you know, there's something to be said about anticipatory grief. I knew that it was just a matter of time. I didn't expect it to happen quite so quickly. You always expect to have more time, right? Mm. And I think that's the one thing that I actually lead grief support groups or grief share. And that's the one thing I just tell everybody. It's like, I can't imagine losing a husband suddenly. But if you've lost your husband suddenly, you can't imagine what it's like to watch them slowly die and and dealing with all that into the story. And I am that other widow. My husband died suddenly. And I thought that he was going to get better. And I always say he got healed in heaven. But at that point, it was just so shocking. And then I hear stories, you know, where the, the long goodbyes and stuff. And I'm like, I didn't get that. But you don't want to pick either one. Right. And, and and I would say, too, that there's people like me that I don't feel like I got the goodbye either, simply because you're kind of thinking you always have more time. You're holding on to hope that they are going to get better, even if it is a terminal diagnosis. Your, your brain isn't ready to grasp the fact yeah. that they are actually going to die because of this. Did you do a lot of, um, as you mentioned, anticipatory grief? And we've talked a lot about that. But did you feel that you did grieving or were you just coping day by day? One thing I look at is my husband died in January. I didn't have to go through Christmas, Thanksgiving for 11 to 12 months. Yeah. And so by the time I got to those, they weren't so raw. Kind of a you know? blessing. And, wow. And we talk about, too, that sometimes in the second year is worse than the first year. Right. And because I was, I kind of had a full year to get ready for that, I felt like that was a little bit easier. In fact, I think the hardest holiday for me was actually New Year's. And I, it took me a long time to figure out why that was. But in the end, what I determined was my husband died in January of 2012. I had almost a full year where I at least had memories from those couple of weeks of January with him. And when I was going into 2013, I would have, as I look back on 2013, I would have no memories of my husband in that year. And that, that's daunting, isn't that, it? When and you that's what it, it was, because it wasn't like I was missing so big. New Year's party, that wasn't our deal, you know, kind of thing. But it's just, it's those little things like yeah. that. Yeah. We have a big box of tissues here. <laughs> and, and I hope this doesn't you make you cry. cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't leave until you cry. No, I'm just kidding. But I was looking at your Facebook page. I was stalking yes. you a little bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I saw an entry from September 11th, 2022. Did you get married on September 11th? September 10th. September 10th. Okay, so this was, but it was, it's close. Yeah, usually when I would post on Facebook, it's one of those things where it's like, do you want everybody to be like, oh my gosh, I remember, you know, so I kind of wait till the end of the day. So sometimes it shows up on the next day. So you can just have that day. Yeah. I I didn't see that the first time I looked at it. I'm kind of digressing here, but yeah, I loved your post. Can I share it? Yeah. And that's Uh, when you're sharing. It's a beautiful picture of you with us from September 11th, 2022, a couple of years ago. (laughs) Um, 28 years ago today, we committed to be with each other until death do us part. I'll always be your wife. And so I need to acknowledge the 17 and one third years we had together. Even though I've learned how to do life on my own, there are still days when I miss doing it with you. I hope you know that I'm thriving because I still feel you encouraging me every step of the way. I'm doing exactly what you would want me to living life to the fullest. Thanks for continuing to be a part of my life in your own special way. Happy anniversary. It's so touching. Thank you. I love that. I just, I absolutely love that. And just kind of a note about where you are, where you were at that time, and that you wrote, I'm thriving. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously that was 10 years after my husband passed away. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Back to Widow Might, Kathy Scheffler, director of widowmite.org, is my guest today on a lot of widow words, a widow's heart. <laughs> Tell us about the four cornerstones of widow might, because I love the word thrive. It's such a great mm. word. We should have t-shirts. 
<laughs> I actually, we, we've talked about that. We're like, we're a little, so it's live, heal, grow, and thrive. And we're like, well, we probably don't want the live and heal, but the grow and thrive might be kind of fun. Just so can have, you explain each yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. So it was the progression. When you first become a widow, living is all you can do. It's taking that next breath. It's getting out of bed. It's yeah. having a cup of coffee, whatever it is. It's just living. It's just taking that, that Moving next step. forward, one step. step at a time. And then uh, healing is when you're starting to do all of that grief work, right? You're trying to figure out how yeah. to heal from, from your loss. And then eventually you get into this point where you're growing and that's where you're, you feel like you're alive again, maybe, you know, because I do feel like those first kind of steps, you're, you're not even sure you even feel like you're fully alive. What our goal is to get people all the way from that living all the way to the thriving. So the thriving is basically when you are giving back. And that's, you know, where I find myself today is all of those things that I've done, taken all of what I've experienced and helping other widows or whatever it is for you. I mean, it doesn't have to be that for everybody, but that is that's what I found myself in is I found, you know, after my husband passed away, I went through and did a lot of the grief work and I did a couple of support groups. One was for young widows and it was through a local hospice organization. And then the other one was Grief Share, which is a one that I'm a very big proponent of. I think a lot of us have been through grief that. Share. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Went through both of those programs and Grief Share is a 13 week program videos and stuff. So when you're done, you're done. Now, the other one that I was a part of was an ongoing one. It just met monthly. And I found a year after my husband passed away, I was like going to that group, but I wasn't going for me anymore. I was going to see if I could help, if I had some, something that could help somebody else there. That's definitely growth, you know, right. isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. That was what I felt like God had said to you, me, okay, this is you. I mean, there's things that my husband and I did together, but this is you. Because I mean, when my husband was ill, we set up a scholarship. And we set up a scholarship because he was at the U of M and it was a teaching hospital. It was a medical student that followed him all the way through. And he was like, and he loved his surgeon. And he said, I want these medical students to learn from that surgeon. He learned that he was doing mission trips. So now we sponsor students to go on these mission trips every year. And I still love it, but that's not my thing, right? Yeah. So widow might is my thing. We're talking with Kathy Scheffler. We'll be back with more on A Widow's Heart. Hey, I'm so grateful that a wonderful nonprofit supports a widow's heart. They're called Wings for Widows. From them, I've learned that more than 85% of women of all ages responding to a survey said that being the sole financial decision maker is the most challenging aspect of being a widow. I know, I was there when I lost my first husband, and I wish I had Wings for Widows back then. Their mission is to provide personalized financial wellness coaching to help widows move forward with confidence and hope. You can learn more at wingsforwidows.org. All services provided at no cost. That's wingsforwidows.org. Again, Kathy Scheffler is my guest, is my friend, and director of Widow Might, uh, widowmite.org, if you would like to learn more about that amazing nonprofit for widows. Kathy, so you've shared a lot about your journey, and I'm just wondering, how has your faith played a part in this? How has God showed up? Yeah, pretty early on, I realized that I was depending on my husband for a lot of things that I should have depended on God for, right? God has shown up in a lot of ways and, and kind of become my husband. I mean, I look at even, what was it, about six weeks after my husband passed away, I was on vacation in Cabo. We were going to go on vacation, and, and when I was planning the funeral, my sister was booking me a flight to go with them. We traveled with my sister and brother-in-law a lot. And while I was there, it was like I knew this trip was going to be hard, but, and it was, we'd never been to Cabo together, but it was very similar. So it was one of those things of like, okay, okay, God, what, what's this going to be like? And I don't know if you've ever been to Cabo. It's like uh, the Baja Peninsula in, in Mexico. I want to go. Oh yeah, you do want to go. <laughs> I've been to other parts of Mexico, but, but not uh, there. Because of the peninsula, the, the whales come up there to birth their young in, in that, in that time of year. And we literally saw whales breaching, playing off our balcony every single day. I have never seen so much whale watching for free in my life. Wow. But I think that was a little like God giving me something a little special. Can I share a quick story yeah. with you too? Sure, it's your podcast. I had. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's right. No, I'm just kidding. I just had a flash of something. I mean, the exact same thing happened with me where a couple different times friends were like, let's go on this trip. 
we had this trip planned. I'm like, no, no, I don't want to go. Boo hoo. I want to have a pity party. You know, John, my late husband and I were both in radio scheduled to host a trip to Hawaii. Oh, you know, just looking forward to that. And then, then he died. He went to heaven. And I went ahead and brought my niece and hosted this trip and we went whale watching. And several times during that trip, it was snorkeling. And then this whale watching trip, I just felt God going, look at what you would have missed out on. Look at what I have in store for you. There is a hope and there is a future. And we were on this this whale watching and it was, bef- I think, really before everyone had iPhones and people had the cameras and they were all taking pictures. And I saw this with my own eyes and I still have it in my heart even better than if I had a picture of it. But it was one of the biggest whales um, that there could be with two calves. And the calves were playing. It was all of a sudden like the mama said, hey, I'm going to show you how to do this. Mm -hmm. And she disappeared for the longest time, almost 60 seconds. And she came up and fully out of the water. Kathy, I'm just seeing this right now. Did a little twist and landed, sucked all of the oxygen out of the air. And I could feel it just hit me in the chest, Mm -hmm. the pressure. And it landed and the little little babies kept playing, but it was so epic and such an, a magnificent thing to see that it was just a gift didn't you, from heaven. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And I love when um, you shared that story and, and many other widows will share their God stories, their right. God wings. Right. You know, we right. hear a lot about those, don't we? Yeah. Well, and there was just even just the, the everyday things. I, I say sometimes see those people with God with skin on, right? Mm-hmm. Those people like... I have a neighbor who actually just passed away that he came, he started uh, blowing out my driveway when my husband was sick and he came right after he passed away and he's, he had tears in his eyes said, can I still blow out your driveway? And he did for the next 12 years. Oh, it's not that everyone has this gift. I think many people are gifted with it because people don't know what to do sometimes when someone loses a spouse. But others just show up and do things. Who else did that in your life? Yeah, it's funny because it's all the people you don't expect, right? Mm. I have one neighbor that actually started showing up when my husband was sick. And she'd be like, I'm at the grocery store. What do you want me to pick up? What I learned later on, I didn't really even know her that well. My husband had kind of a side gig. And that was to do low voltage wiring in people's houses. And she had (laughs) wired her basement, yes. The also awesome my guy, <laughs> IT guy. Eh? The joke at his office was, "If it plugs in, it's my job." His side hustle. <laughs> um, but I later learned that she had had twins and lost one of the twins, and I think it was the fact that she understood, she got it. And I don't fault my other friends that haven't been through it, but they yeah. weren't there the same way as somebody that had been through it. That's a really good point. We have to bring this up, and and, and it's really hard to talk about, but we have we're kindred spirits. In, in being dog moms. Mm-hmm. And um, we have three at home now. I don't know what we're thinking of, but we've got um, Lily, who's seven, and just got Barney, a little Westy, to keep Lily company. And then we've got a Pomeranian. But before that, when, when John and I were married, we had acquired Gidget and Gomer, also Westies. And after John passed away, if it weren't for those two little dogs, I really don't know how I would have gotten through it, uh, you know, day by day. And I just want to tell you how sorry I am at the loss of your little Quigley. I saw him on Facebook. What a beautiful, beautiful dog. Yeah, it's, uh, he just, like you said, he just passed away in the last three weeks. And a little backstory, my husband never wanted a dog. When you're in hospice, you get this little, all these things, what to expect. And one of the things in there was, well, after a loved one passes away, you might want to get a pet. And I kind of tucked that away. And so, he was my Black Friday purchase in 2012, the year my husband passed away. So I'd been I'd been alone for 10, 11 months, and I brought him into my life. I said, here's the new man in my life. And, <laughs> Where did the name come from? Oh, that's very interesting. So, you know, when you're trying to come up with a dog's name, you're like, okay, there's everybody's got the main names taken, right? You, I wanted something unique. He was a 20-pound Cavachon, which is cavalier Bashan mix, and I wanted something that's kind of reflected like not a big dog so you can't have like max or rough <laughs> or you do what you always do you google dog names right oh yeah yeah and this one came up then you get really confused right right <laughs> this, this one came up <laughs> and the funny thing as i started researching it it's actually a last name if you recall several years ago one of our vikings kickers his last name was quigley oh yeah yeah and when i picked it everybody thought it was the movie quigley down under 
which I didn't watch Tom Selleck movie. I didn't okay. watch it until after I got him, and I was like, oh, I hope I don't hate this movie. Um, <laughs> but as I researched the name, it's actually an Irish last name, and it means unruly hair. <laughs> and when Quigley was a puppy, he had what they call apricot color, so it kind of had that reddish mm-hmm. tinge, and his hair was all over the place. And then he kind of has adopted a lot of names like Wiggly Quigley, like he wouldn't mm-hmm. sit still. So, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it just perfectly fits. So I just love it. And I love the fact that I could call him Q for short. I think that's a fun letter. My grandfather's name was Quinton. And I always liked the letter Q. I thought that was oh, kind of cool. So that, That's so great. And it's just, it is that unconditional love that they demonstrate. And right. you can just cry into their unruly fur. Okay. And, and then they'll sit there literally will listen to you. Right. <laughs> I don't know they know what you're saying, but yeah. I, I just think that they're really a, really a gift. The cards, the texts that I've gotten from mm-hmm. people about like, he's missed by not only me, but yeah, the house is way too quiet. I know it's totally an anonymous ministry, Widow Might, but would you be able to share a story of maybe a life changed or, or, or something? What I say to all of our Widow Connect leaders is if you have somebody come to your group and they meet somebody and that understands them and you never see them again, that's a win. And that's what I think we, what I see the most is just people, that progression. And I mean, I lead, mm-hmm. I lead grief share as well. That progression of from when they come that first time and they just can't hardly say their name. They can't say their husband's name. They can't say what happens. And then as the weeks and months go by, you do see them smile. You see them laugh and, yeah. and that sort of thing. And we have tons of stories and we bring them up in our uh, event that we do. We do a virtual event every February mm-hmm. and we have what we call widow spotlights. And we have various people that have done things because of their life. Yeah. Like one of the gals, her husband owned a website company. Did yeah. you know that she has now started what's called the Widow Collaborative? And they are um, vetting all kinds of resources. Uh, when she lost her husband, she said, I had Team Amy. I had all these people around me that would help me navigate through all the stuff. And so she's got a group of young widows around her and they're creating teams for new widows. So like, what is it that you need? And we've got you know, what it, whatever it is, we've got a resources and we can put you in touch with I that. see another podcast, Kathy. Well, yeah, I'm, you got to get Amy back here. Yeah, that's right. Well, so many miracles. And if you're listening right now, maybe you speak to the person who is there who just lost their husband recently or they, they just can't seem to move on to grow. You'll never forget. You will never forget. Right. And you will have your moments. But what encouragement do you have for them? I think the biggest thing is that you're not alone and we're there as far as widow might or even if you need other resources that we don't have. Um, I've got a whole list of people that I can refer people to as well. But just know that you're not alone and that there are a group of people that want to come alongside you. And I think there's just such power in getting connected with other widows. Yeah. And then quickly before we we wrap this up, did you want to tell me of that story about how you did come to uh, be the director because yeah. you are just so, so well fitted for that spot. Well, so I came onto the board in 2019, actually, when you vacated the yes, board. Yes, I'm, I'm a board member emeritus <laughs> right, <exactly>. because <laughs> I still <laughs> love Widow White. This title without all the work is great. <laughs> um, what I did there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I literally went to my first board meeting and I was like, okay, this is fine. And so that was in the summer of 2019. And over that summer, I actually applied for another job. I was thinking about ever since my husband had passed away, I was always trying to figure out, it's like, okay, what's next, God? I'm at the point where I could switch careers. I can do, you know, what is it that you want me to do? And I'd been very involved with pre-share and they had a position open. Yeah. So I applied for it and I used our Widow Might founder, Dave Thielman, as a reference. Episode one, episode you know, one. Away. Exactly. <laughs> Through a series of events, I realized that wasn't a good fit for me. These, It just... I'd been in corporate America and got a lot of vacation and I was not ready to give up a lot of vacation. So I took myself out of that. And then Dave kind of tapped me on the shoulder in November. He's like, let's do lunch. He's like, we have been praying for years, I guess it was, for a new executive director because Dave had kind of been filling that role on a need to basis. Yeah. And he's like, I think it was literally the fact that he saw that I was willing to give up my corporate career 
that he was like, okay, she's got something here. A skill set. Yeah. And a heart. Exactly. <laughs> Who would have thought that applying for a job that I ended up pulling my name out of that would lead to becoming the executive director? He kind of planted the idea and he said, I'm going to head to Arizona. I'll be back in February, I think it was. Let me know what you think when I get back. And, and when I got back, I was just like, I said it in kind of a weird way. I said, I can't not do this. It just fits, you know, kind of thing. And then as you know, life would have it. That is 2020. So yeah. I literally got voted in as executive director and it was over a year before we did an in-person event. That's right. Yeah. So during that time, I developed our one virtual event that we have. We've created a few other ones to kind of fill the gap. But yeah, I look back at that. And I'm like, I'm not even sure how I got through that time, but I could have never planned it. It was only God. Absolutely. I mean, thank you so much for sharing your, your story and your heart. And again, it's widowmite.org. For more information, and there, there's so much great help for you. There are vetted services and things that you can check up on. And I check every month or so. I look, and there's something new. So. Yeah, we put out a blog post, and we reference a lot of these podcasts on those on our website every every month. Yep, and of course on on the socials as well on Facebook too. So. Well, Kathy, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? We just have our events coming up. So if you are local, we have our spring brunch at the end of April, and we've got a boat cruise in July, and then November, and obviously in November. We've got great speakers lined up, and we're excited. It's so fun. Well, God bless you, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Again, Kathy Scheffler is Executive Director of Widow Might. That's Widow, M-I-G-H-T, dot org. And when you listen to A Widow's Heart, maybe you have something you would like to share. I would love to hear your story, a part of your story, maybe how God has worked in your life. Through this difficult time, maybe you can encourage others. Uh, You can tell me about that. Maybe you'll be in a future podcast because there's a new feature. If you go to wowgod.com, you can get the podcast many places. But if you specifically go to wowgod.com, you'll find A Widow's Heart podcast. And if you go there, use your phone. There's a record button. You have 10 minutes to tell your story. And and don't feel it has to be perfect. We will edit. (laughs) But you have up to 10 minutes to share what's on your heart. I would love to hear from you. Again, wowgod.com. Just hit the record button. Use your phone uh, to record. We will be in touch with you. I would love to hear part of your story at wowgod.com. I hope you have a wonderful time until we meet again on A Widow's Heart. A Widow's Heart, grateful for the support of Wings for Widows and is part of the Wow God Podcast Network wherever you get your podcasts and at wowgod.com, if I haven't said that enough. (laughs) 